Hi LEGO fans, it's finally here in all its 5,544 piece glory and in the words of young Ronald Weasley, it looks bloody brilliant. Today I'm going to be unboxing, speed building and reviewing set number 75978, the epic diagonally from LEGO Harry Potter. LEGO has clearly not used an undetectable extension charm on the packaging. This box is huge and weighs more than a cage full of Cornish pixies. LEGO's first attempt at Diagon Alley came in 2001 with 4723 Diagon Alley Shops. It was, shall we say, a very colourful interpretation. A more accomplished version came in 2011 with the excellent 10217 Diagon Alley. This also included Gringotts Bank and Borgin and Burks. 40289, a micro scale version of Diagon Alley, was a free gift with purchase in 2018. This remains relatively scarce and is very desirable to Harry Potter collectors. We'll bring all of the Diagon Alley sets together for a side by side comparison later in the video. As well as well known wizarding establishments from Diagon Alley, the 5,500 piece park count includes a magically magnificent menagerie of 14 minifigures, including 13 exclusives. We have Keeper of Grounds and Keys at Hogwarts, Rubius Hagrid, Dark Arts Professor and Five Time Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award winner, Gilderoy Lockhart, Purveyor of the Finest Ice Cream, Florian Fortescue, a photographer from the Daily Prophet, Maker of the Finest Wand, Garrick Ollivander, the obligatory Harry Potter complete with dirty face, a Chamber of Secrets era Ronald Weasley, a teeny tiny Ginny Weasley, the Weasley matriarch Molly Wobbles, a rather snappily dressed George Weasley, and Weasley's Wizard Wheezy's co-proprietor Fred Weasley, Hermione Granger wearing half of her Gryffindor school uniform, a particularly smug looking Draco Malfoy, and Lucius Malfoy dressed for the fight scene that never was. Diagon Alley is made up of several buildings, some of which house more than one business. The look and feel is very similar to what you might expect from a modular building. As the 5,544 piece park count alludes, this is not a set for novice witches and wizards. The recommended age for builders is 16 plus. If that wasn't enough to deter the casual builder, you are going to need a vault full of galleons to buy one of these. Diagon Alley will set you back 400 US dollars, 400 euros, or 370 of your hard earned Great British pounds. The finished build is absolutely huge, it is 102.4 centimeters wide or 40.3 inches. This set is so huge that LEGO even had to print some product photography on the top of the box. Over on the back of the box we get to peek inside Diagon Alley and learn about all of the stores within. Diagon Alley actually consists of four different buildings and I believe each one of these comes with its own instruction booklet. The first building is occupied by Ollivander's one shop and Scribulous. Inside Ollivander's you can recreate the scene where Harry gets his first wand. Inside the second building we have quality Quidditch supplies and the entrance to the Daily Profit. Here we can see the Malfoys picking out Nimbus 2000 wands for the Slytherin Quidditch team. Next we have bookseller Flourish and Blots and Florian Fortescue's Ice Cream Parlour. Inside Flourish and Blots we can recreate the Gilderoy Lockhart book signing event. The final building, and the one I'm most looking forward to, houses Weasley's Wizard Wheezes and the entrance to Nocturne Alley. Here we can see a very young Hermione and Ginny eyeing up some love potions, even though those didn't come about until book 6. Before we get started on the speed build, let's open up this box and see what Lego goodness lies within. Here's everything that came inside the box. We've got 41 bags of Lego numbered for stages 1 through 20, a 151 page instruction booklet covering Ollivanders and Scribulus, a 143 page booklet for quality Quidditch supplies and the Daily Profit, 173 pages for Florian Fortescues and Flourish and Blots, and a whopping 222 pages for Weasley's Wizard Wheezes and Nocturne Alley. We also have four 16x32 dark grey base plates, a bag of assorted base plates, a sticker sheet for Ollivanders and Scribulus, another for quality Quidditch supplies and the Daily Profit, more stickers for Flourish and Blots and Florian Fortescues, and sweet baby Jesus, what were you thinking, Fred and George? Finally, we have a mystery box that I'm not allowed to show you, like that's gonna happen. I'm going to go ahead and build the magic that is Diagon Alley, and today this is going to be a 4 minute speed build!
is the absolutely insane 5544 piece diagonally from Lego Harry Potter. I say insane because this thing is over a metre long and took 10 hours and 23 minutes to put together. The finished article depicts just 8 of the shops from Diagon Alley. In reality there are believed to be 32 shops plus various stalls and peddlers. Starting at one end of Diagon Alley we have Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. Ollivanders shares a 16 by 32 base plate with Scribulus, a shop that sells ink, quills and parchment. Next we have this delightful pink building which is home to quality Quidditch supplies and the offices of the Daily Prophet. If you're partial to a good book and delicious ice cream then this is the place for you. This is the home of Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlour and bookshop Flourish and Blots. Finally, at number 93 Diagon Alley we find the new home of Weasley and Weasley. This is Weasley's Wizard Wheezes and just behind it you can see the entrance to Nocturne Alley. Not only is Diagon Alley mind-blowingly detailed on the outside, the interiors to every shop are meticulously decorated. Now I am a bit of a potterhead so my expectations of this set are pretty high. Diagon Alley is my happy place and I definitely don't want to see it sold short. That said, this is a small subset of the shops of Diagon Alley and we're missing important details like Gringotts. Hopefully that's an indication of another instalment to come. One really nice thing about this set is that each one of the buildings is built on its own 16x32 base plate. Each one has connection points on the side so you can actually join these together. Similarly there are also connection points on the back so you can join these back to back. But the really neat thing is that you can bring these shops together face to face. This makes it possible to imagine taking a stroll down Diagon Alley and also makes it much easier to display. This set is so cool! We're going to take a detailed look at each one of these fantastic Diagon Alley shops in detail. We'll be checking out the colourful exteriors, all of the cool stuff you'll find inside the interiors, we'll also be checking out the wildlife, getting up close and personal with all of the minifigures, and revealing the secret that lies within the mystery box. Welcome, LEGO fans, to Diagon Alley. Like countless generations of young witches and wizards, we're going to start our exploration of Diagon Alley at Ollivander's One Shop. The Ollivander's storefront is easily recognisable thanks to the large bay windows. The LEGO version may not have a basement, but we do have these grates to protect the basement windows. Ollivander's is not known for its elaborate window displays, and this yellow glass really makes it hard to see what's inside. If we were staying faithful to the book there should be a single wand resting on a purple cushion. In the case of the Lego version we have a wand in a box. The understated black door is very simple and sits below a couple of yellow windows to let in light. Above the windows we have simple painted signs declaring this to be Ollivanders. These are the first of many frustrating stickers within this set. Spreading the name Ollivanders across two stickers really doesn't work. In hindsight I should have stuck these closer together. Above the door we find that Ollivanders has been making fine wands since 382 BC. It's thought that the original Ollivander arrived with the Romans and set up a stall selling wands to ancient British wizards. Up on the next floor we have a second set of windows and some more Ollivanders branding. The Ollivanders logo consists of a swishing wand. Also up on this second level we have a pair of owls. The one on the left has been around for quite some time and was used in Harry Potter sets back in 2010. The other owl which seems to be half asleep must be a brand new design. The roof is flat but decorative and I love the use of textured bricks. Also up here we find an interesting pair of chimneys. I love the use of hinged pieces to give the chimney a very rickety look. The side of Ollivanders, as is common with modular buildings, is pretty much undecorated. What is decorated however is the interior and check this out. There's a fold out staircase leading to the upper floor of the shop. It's really neat that you can fold this away because then you can display the stores back to back. Inside behind the cash register you can see boxes and boxes of wands. Some of these can actually be removed. The boxes would appear to be new elements and actually seem to contain something. In fact inside we have a single wand. Go on, give it a wave! The wand with the phoenix tail core just happens to be behind the cash register. The cash register is a stickered piece as is the correspondence on the front desk. It's really difficult to see into the window but you may see a single wand on display. In the other window you'll also find a wand illuminated by a candle and a Victorian lantern. In the storage area under the stairs we can find even more wand boxes including three wand boxes that actually contain wands. The stairs also provide a convenient way to reach the next level. The upper level provides a more private place for checking out the merchandise. 
Here we have more dusty boxes of wands and a stepladder to reach the higher shelves. There's a handy sideboard illuminated by a candle for setting down the wands while the customer makes the tough decision. I really like the way the hinged piece has been used to create an open drawer, it looks really cool. In the other corner there is a comfortable looking swivel chair. The perfect place to sit down and play Candy Crush while the missus checks out every wand in the shop. All things considered, I think the designers did a good job with the interior. It has just the right amount of detail whilst leaving plenty of space for minifigures. Next door to Ollivander's we find the more modest premises occupied by the Diagon Alley branch of Scribulus. With its grey and blue exterior, it is a pretty good recreation of the real thing. At street level we have a display window and a neat little blue door. There's also a grate which hints that there must be a cellar. The window display is pretty obscured but does include a decorative scroll, some quills and an inkwell. We also have the name of the shop neatly scribed above the window. You'll find a couple of steps leading up to the front door which is illuminated by a candle. Some other advertisements higher up on the building indicate that other services may be on offer here. Perhaps somebody is skilled at divination because apparently you can get a reading for a galleon. Also available are fear of flying classes. And then we have a sign which is more in keeping with the business which says Scribulous Writing Instruments. Hovering above and carrying a copy of the Daily Prophet we have Hedwig. I really like the transparent piece which gives the illusion that Hedwig is flying. The roof on the building is flat and pretty uninspired. The only features worth pointing out are the chimney and the steps which provide access to the roof of Ollivander's. The interior of Scribulus is pretty tiny. On the wall we have a display of various writing instruments. They have plenty of black ink but seem to be out of colour change ink. There is however no shortage of quills so long as you don't mind a red or white one. Up on the top shelf we have the most fancy quills which come with a quill stand. I believe the cylinders over to the right are going to be rolls of parchment. On a table towards the back of the store is some parchment where you can try out the quills. Peering deep into the store you can also see the decorative scroll which is on display in the window. Although it's not exactly clear how you get there, there is a small flat above the shop. This might be occupied by the witch or wizard who runs Scribulous, or it may even be rented by the person who does the readings. In any case, looking at the threadbare sofa, it would appear they've fallen on hard times. Also up here we have a small fireplace which I guess could come in handy with the absence of stairs. Other decorations include a rug and an interesting sideboard complete with some very dark looking artifacts. Check out the unusual ape-like skull and the mysterious red flask of liquid. Perhaps the occupant of this abode may be more comfortable in Nocturne Alley. We do know that Harry visited Scribulus in 1991 and 1992. By 1996, Scribulus had either been abandoned or ransacked by Death Eaters. Strolling a little further along Diagon Alley, we come to this fantastic pink property. It's shared by Quality Quidditch Supplies and The Daily Profit. The Daily Profit is a little bit disappointing because it is just basically the front door. That said, we do have some decoration above the door and the name of the newspaper. I also like those decorative Greek style scrolls. The door is decorated with a large sticker including a nameplate for the Daily Prophet. There's also a hanging sign advertising the name of the newspaper. The door opens into a dark hallway. Here we find a crate of Daily Prophet newspapers waiting to be picked up, a wanted poster which is a sticker stuck at a jaunty angle, and some kind of community notice board. I see that somebody's missing some golden snitches, he who must not be named has returned, and some terror occurred at the Quidditch World Cup. High above the hallway you'll find a large spider's web complete with spider. The building contains no office space or printing equipment, but it does seem that the Daily Prophet is storing things here. Within the attic space we have piles of the Daily Prophet and some boxes of stuff. There's also a new style Lego rat which seems to be interested in a block of cheese. Access to the storage room can be gained through this door, and the windows are shielded by old copies of the Daily Prophet. Whoever's responsible for storing stuff did not do a good job. You'll notice several copies of the Daily Prophet left abandoned on the roof. Most of this building is occupied by the much more impressive Quality Quidditch Supplies. The shop windows are very impressive and useful for showing off the latest brooms. I'm not sure if that's the Nimbus 2001 or the Firebolt, but it sure looks impressive. The storefront is cleverly constructed and actually leans out from the building. The windows make really nice use of transparent cheese slopes, and the windows themselves are printed which gives the illusion that they're made out of small panes of glass. The entrance is very elegant with a smart red door, and above the door you'll find some familiar symbols from the game of Quidditch. We've got a pair of bludgers and a golden snitch. If that left you in any doubt about this shop then we do have a sign above the window saying Quality Quidditch Supplies. There's also a large hanging sign which says Quidditch on both sides. 
Also interesting is the Hogwarts crest. Presumably this indicates that Quality Quidditch Supplies is a preferred supplier to Hogwarts. I could really use a new broom, so let's step inside and take a look around. The store is laid out on two floors and has no stairs. Those broomsticks are going to come in handy. This place is so fancy they even have a brand new doormat with QQS for Quality Quidditch Supplies. In the window you can find the latest broom which on closer inspection appears to be the Firebolt. The things sticking out of the side would be the footrests. I'm not sure if the colours are totally accurate, but we do appear to have Quidditch robes for the four houses. I'm guessing from left to right we have Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, Slytherin and Hufflepuff. Speaking of Hufflepuff, you can actually see those robes on display. I've not seen that torso print before, so I'm guessing it may be an exclusive. Also on display we have a number of beta bats to cater to every player's preference. On the upper floor we find even more quality Quidditch merchandise. Most notably here we are invited to test fly any of the brooms. These to me look like the Nimbus 2000 and the Nimbus 2001. Tucked away in the corner we have a mannequin wearing Ravenclaw Quidditch robes. As these are technically minifigures we'll take a closer look at them later in the video. Also up here we have an intriguing looking chest and that contains a pair of bludgers and a beater's bat. Finally we have some more shelving containing colourful garments. I like to think these may be spirit gear for popular Quidditch teams like the Hollywood Harpies and Chudley Cannons. So that was quality Quidditch supplies and the daily profit. Does anybody fancy a butterbeer ice cream? These fine looking properties are home to Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlour and bookseller Flourish and Blots. The ice cream parlour was located on the north side of Diagon Alley next to the second hand bookshop. At least it was before Florian Fortescue disappeared in 1996. Florian Fortescue's is a really cute little property. When Harry spent three weeks staying at the Leaky Cauldron in 1993, he spent a lot of time at this parlour. It's a fantastic place to do a little homework, sample some ice creams, and take in the fantastic sights and sounds of Diagon Alley. I really like the use of pastel yellow for the storefront, which makes it look very clean and inviting. We also have a canopy made out of 1x2 plates and tiles. This time we don't have any nasty stickers for the shop name, but we do have this table and chairs complete with ice cream as a nice 3D shop sign. Upstairs we have a window overlooking Diagon Alley and a Victorian style lantern. We also have a really nice textured tile roof which reminds me of Fall Privet Drive. The interior is pretty small and lacks the places to sit down which are described in the book. The tiled black and white floor looks very clean and hygienic and reminds me of the Franklin Fountain in Philadelphia. When you're ready to order you simply approach the counter. Here we have a prepared ice cream sundae and a covered display bowl. Behind the counter we have a selection of goblets and one of the new dessert bowls. This appears to be a new element and recently appeared in the Harry Potter collectible minifigures series 2. This is the first time I'm seeing it in the trans orange colour. While we're in close up mode this is the container from the counter. Interestingly it's actually made with one of these lipstick elements. Above the ice cream parlour we seem to have a private abode. I like to think this might be the place where Florian Fortescue lives. Whoever lives here is a tea drinker, which reminds me that mine is going cold. <sighs> There's also an armchair which is almost perfect, but the hole in the middle really does bug me. It needs some kind of cushion on top. Providing illumination we have an elegant reading lamp, and the room is finished with an elegant rug. Next door to Florian Fortescue's we have the bookseller Flourish and Blots. This was featured quite extensively in Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Established in 1654, the bookseller has a very traditional storefront. Outside you'll find racks of miscellaneous coloured books. Most likely these will be second hand or clearance items. The storefront also has two large display windows. Behind the printed window panes you can actually see a copy of Gilderoy Lockhart's Magical Me. The other window has a large stack of books, but we'll get a better look at those inside. Above the windows we can learn about all of the book related services on offer at Flourish and Blots. As well as selling books, they also have a reading room. They also provide a very traditional bookbinding service. Helping customers to find the shop, we have a large hanging sign. Sadly like most of this set, these are stickered and not printed pieces. The upper floor has a large bay window to let in plenty of light for reading. Decoration on the outside of the building includes these really cool dragon head elements. Finally up on top, we have a traditional tiled roof complete with decorative finials. I like the use of sand green which is a commonly used colour in Harry Potter sets. The interior is a little bit lacking but does give you a sense of the bookstore. Over in the corner you can see a bookshelf with loads of different coloured books and a large stack of books on display in the window. I like the use of the transclear poseable element to make it look like the stack is falling over. 
There's also a really nice decorative support column for the upper floor. To get upstairs, we have this neat retractable staircase. When folded away, it keeps the back of the property nice and flush. Very useful if you want to display these back to back. The upstairs could be the reading room, some extra display space, or even some place that you could have a book signing. Speaking of which, LEGO provided everything we need to recreate the Gilderoy Lockhart book signing event. This includes a fancy book signing desk complete with quill, and a large stack of Gilderoy Lockhart's latest book, Magical Me. Why not pick up a copy of Gadding with Ghouls or Voyages with Vampires while you're here? Upstairs, illuminated by a fancy lantern, we have a book of spells for beginners. Inside we finally find a printed piece, and this explains the swish and flick action for a very popular spell. Wingardium Leviosa! Reverting to copious use of stickers, we have this flourish and blot wall hanging, and a large selection of books. LEGO used a bunch of different elements here to create a very colourful display. Finally, I must point out the decorative railings, the signs which point out books about dragons and alchemy, and on the side of the building we have another one of those wanted posters. So after the excitement of meeting Gilderoy Lockhart and filling up on sugar, there's only one place to go! This has been a long time coming, but finally we can poke around Fred and George's joke shop at 93 Diagon Alley. Welcome to Weasley's Wizard Wheezes! Weasley and Weasley's joke shop stands next to the entrance to Nocturne Alley. This is home to seller of dark artifacts, Borgin and Burks, and is also a good place to get flesh-eating slug repellent. The only things we have which makes this Nocturne Alley are the entrance and the wonky window. Who knows, maybe in a later set this will lead us into Nocturne Alley. Weasley's Wizard Wheezes is every bit as gaudily coloured as you might expect. The lilac bricks contrast jarringly against the bright orange. Now while this may look totally awesome, I do have a big problem with this building. Firstly, it has way too many stickers, and secondly, this sticker sheet is totally jacked. Those stripes on the arms should be in the middle of the sticker. As you can see, this has been cut completely wrong. I went ahead and built this anyway because you guys have been waiting way too long, but I will be reaching out to LEGO to get a replacement sticker sheet, and all of these are getting swapped out. As you've guessed, the stickers in this set really annoy me, and having Weasley's Wizard Wheezes split across four pieces is unforgivable. I do really like the large round windows, but having so many stickers in a $400 set is insane! Those large round windows protruding from the corner span two floors. But of course the most recognisable feature of Weasley's Wizard Wheezes is the large guy with the top hat. A simple mechanism up on the roof allows you to tip the top hat to passers-by. It's very cool. Even ignoring the stickering, it's not perfect. The arms are quite spindly, and the face is quite angular, but this is after all made out of Lego bricks. The outside of the property is covered in signs encouraging you to venture inside. The best in jesting! Disastrous delights! Weasel ease whiz ard wh eases! Masterpieces of modern magic! Petrifying products! Shenanigans for all! Always we ze guaranteed! And of course, once again, Weasley's whiz ard wheezes! Even the side of the building is covered in colourful advertisements. Here you can buy edible dark mark sweets some kind of electricity generating jape, and perfectly illustrating the problem with the sticker sheet, we have an advert for Jinx Off. This was a spell protection kit which included a hat, cloak and gloves. The full kit would set you back 4 galleons, 16 sickles and 25 canuts. This is the largest of the four buildings and is laid out over three floors. It's also crammed from floor to ceiling with Weasley's products. Under the stairs we have a dancing doxy which is a wind-up toy said to drive cats crazy. There's a gaudily coloured cash register complete with defective sticker, and shelves of products which reach all the way to the ceiling. At the back of the store we find all kinds of weird and wonderful boxes and bottles. The contents are a mystery, but I really like the use of trans glitter here. Maybe this is Peruvian darkness powder or something. Perhaps the other boxes contain skiving snack boxes and extendable ears. The stickers on the staircase invite us to venture up for more magical mayhem. They also seem to be lacking handrails. Thankfully we do have colourful handrails on the upper floors which recreate the interior of the joke shop perfectly. In the corner it looks like we've got a Weasley recreation of the acid pops sold by Honeydukes in Hogsmeade. We also have a stack of Fred Weasley's basic blaze boxes. This came from the Explosive Enterprises line and contained an assortment of magical fireworks. Inside you'd find things like whizbangs and whammy rockets. Here we have more shelves stocked with Weasley's magical randomness. I'm not sure what the crystal and the chalice are for, but I do recognise the box of juggling balls up on top. Behind those you'll find even more products in the corner. The final flight of stairs takes us to the third sales floor. Here we can find all kinds of weird and wonderful Weasley's merchandise. 
Here we find an interesting looking geode and some boxes containing random Weasley stuff. I can only speculate what the tiny statues might be for, but hopefully the Weasleys aren't getting into voodoo. What I definitely don't see here are any of Fred and George's special line of Wonder Witch products. What we do get is a behind the scenes look at the mechanism which works the top hat. It's a very simple lever operated mechanism. Protruding from the back of the building we have this big bunch of balloons which look decidedly out of place. It's a good detail as the movie did include a bunch of large balloons with W's printed on them. You can also fold this away in case you want to display the buildings back to back. If like me you were disappointed with the lack of Wonder Witch products then I have some good news. Ginny, who is clearly too young to be interested in boys, has found a display of Wonder Witch love potions. You'll remember these from Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. There's not really enough room in the store for this, but I'm very pleased that it was included. The trans pink love hearts are especially nice elements. So we've taken a look at all of the exterior features of the shops of Diagon Alley. We've also had a good poke around inside all of the shop interiors. Later in the video we're going to be comparing this to other Diagon Alley sets. But before then we need to take a look at the minifigures, which reminds me. Now before I forget we do need to take a look at this mystery box. As it says on the front, 21, Silencio, keep it between us. That would indicate some kind of secret, but what does 21 stand for? It can't be the 21st anniversary of the first book because that was in 2018. The first movie was released in 2001 which would make the anniversary 2022. So honestly, I've no idea what the 21 stands for. Let's just tear this thing open and see what's inside. Ok so it's nice to get a bonus, but this is not exactly a surprise. The Hagrid should have been included in the set. Also if you check out the last instruction booklet it does reveal the secret. The really nice thing is that we seem to get a bonus Harry which takes the minifigure count up to 15. It's actually quite a nice little thing and the bonus minifigure is awesome. As well as being a minifigure display stand we also have a quote from the book. Welcome Harry to Diagon Alley. It rhymes and everything. Nice little touch Lego, well played. By including the two Quidditch mannequins and the bonus Harry Potter, this 5544 piece Lego set actually includes 17 minifigures. Rubius Hagrid, Gilderoy Lockhart, Florian Fortescue, Daily Prophet Photographer, Garrick Ollivander, Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Ginny Weasley, Molly Weasley, George Weasley and Fred Weasley, Hermione Granger, Draco Malfoy and Lucius Malfoy, Harry Potter again, a Ravenclaw Quidditch mannequin and another from Hufflepuff. We're starting off with the HP 144 Rubius Hagrid which first appeared in 2018. A few people have asked me what I mean when I say HP 144. This is actually a catalogue number assigned to minifigures. It helps you find them in places like Bricklink and also in Brickset. This for example is HP001 Hermione Granger. The HP stands for the theme which is Harry Potter and 001 means she is the first catalogued character. There are actually five different Rubius Hagrid minifigures. I just covered all of these in a recent video so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. This version of Hagrid came out in 2018 and appears in three different sets. Hagrid doesn't really change throughout the Harry Potter movies, so I'm going to assume this one is based on the Philosopher's Stone and also the Chamber of Secrets. Comparing the minifigure to the movie, the coat is too light, but the hair, beard and eyebrows are perfect. Hagrid is equipped with his pink umbrella which conceals a wand. He uses it to enter Diagon Alley and also to give Dudley Dursley a tail. The torso is really nicely printed and has separate arms which snap into the sockets. The legs are the very small versions and simply push into the bottom of the body. The hair and beard are perfect and made out of one piece of plastic. Removing it reveals a slightly creepy facial expression. If you want to see every Lego Hagrid ever made then do check out my video from last week. If I remember you'll find a link to it on screen now. Next we have HP243 Professor Gilderoy Lockhart Order of Merlin 3rd Class. He is of course a famous author and 5 time winner of which weekly's most charming smile award. This latest version of Gilderoy Lockhart is actually the third Lego minifigure. His first appearance was in set number 4733 The Dueling Club from 2002. 
Also in 2002, Lockhart appeared in 4730 The Chamber of Secrets. This latest version shows Gilderoy dressed in his favourite colour, lilac. Even his cloak comes in this particularly fetching shade of purple. I love the two-tone fabric with the gold lining. Now I believe this is the costume he was wearing at the book signing in Flourish and Blots. It certainly looks like it, although the costume in the movie does look blue instead of lilac. The legs are standard minifigure legs and lack any printing. This is a bit of a shame because the torso printing ends abruptly. What we do get to compensate is some very vivid gold metallic printing. As well as the gold vest, Lockhart wears a white shirt, flowery cravat and robes in his favourite colour purple. Although you don't see it for the cape, there is some printing on the back of the torso. This shows a few creases and a strap to adjust the robes. The hair is a good choice and captures the waves found in Kenneth Branagh's hair. The main facial expression shows a very confident looking Gilderoy with that award winning smile. The other expression on the other hand shows him when he's been found out. I love that nervous smile and the bead of sweat. Although Lockhart wrote about all of his heroic acts, he actually didn't do any of those. He just used memory charms to force the people who actually did those great deeds into forgetting what they did and then took all of the credit. Next in catalogue order we have the HP 244 Florian Fortescue. He is of course the proprietor of the ice cream parlour and appears on screen for all of two seconds. He comes with a couple of accessories and is holding both a spoon and one of those new style dessert bowls. I think that flavour may be chocolate and peanut butter. He only gets a brief appearance on screen and it's not exactly a close up. That said, the designers have done a really good job of recreating his costume. I can also confirm from checking out the movie that Florian Fortescue's is right next door to Nocturne Alley. The minifigure starts off pretty boring with plain brown legs. The torso, however, is really nicely printed and really does match the movie. Florian wears some kind of orange shirt with brown bow tie and a vest. It's the kind of vest that would come with a three-piece suit and as you can see around the back we've got some printing for the creases. The hair is the same design as the one used on Garrick Ollivander, except in this case it's brown and not grey. I also think this guy bears more than a passing resemblance to Nicolas Cage. The main expression shows a very friendly looking Florian Fortescue complete with gold rimmed glasses. The alternate expression drops a smile and makes him look almost sad. Florian was dragged away by the Death Eaters in 1996 so perhaps he had some worries on his mind. I love it when LEGO recreates these more obscure characters. We've never seen Florian Fortescue before but he is a fantastic addition to this set. This bad tempered little chap is the HP245 Daily Profit Photographer. I believe his actual name was Bozo which would be quite appropriate. He comes with a very old fashioned looking camera which matches the one in the movie really nicely. The resemblance between the minifigure and the character in the movie is pretty good. If we're being picky here, the hat was olive green and not brown, and the jacket was definitely less stripy than we see on the minifigure. Bozo is quite vertically challenged and as you can see here we have the child sized legs. The torso print is so old fashioned it is almost Dickensian. We've got a white shirt with black bow tie, tan vest and then the stripy jacket. You'll find more of those stripes on the back of the torso and a couple of metallic buttons. Now the main facial print shows this guy looking quite charming. He clearly knows how to turn it on and off. In the movie he barges past everybody to try and get his photograph. The alternate expression looks a lot less friendly. Out of my way, this is for the Daily Prophet. Both the hair and the hat are moulded into a single part and I love the kind of crook in the top of the hat. The textured hair is also superb. Bozo spent quite a lot of time working with Rita Skeeter and they are both really horrible characters. Bad tempered paparazzi aside, I really do like this minifigure. Next we have the HP246 Garrick Ollivander, maker of the finest ones. He was the proprietor of Ollivanders for most of the 20th century and we actually have three Lego minifigures of this guy. Each one of these minifigures came in a different Lego diagonally set. The first Ollivander came in 2010 with the 10217 diagonally set. We'll dig that out a little bit later. The other two are much more recent and remarkably similar. The one on the right came with the micro scale diagonally and the one on the left with the big one. You'll notice those torsos are the same design with just a variation in colour for the jacket. It's a similar picture with the printing on the back. I believe this portrays Garrick Ollivander as shown in the first movie. The vest should really be lilac and the jacket a much darker red. The ruffles in the shirt however are absolutely perfect. The main facial expression is great and shows a very nervous smile. I'd be nervous too if I was handing a wand to an 11 year old. The alternate expression appears to be much more serious and measured. Although I've never noticed a barber shop in Diagon Alley, it appears that Garrick and Florian go to the same stylist. 
I'm a little disappointed that this is almost the same minifigure we got in 2018. But this is a Diagon Alley set, and you can't have a Diagon Alley set without Garrick Ollivander. We also can't have a Diagon Alley set without the boy what lived. This is the HP 247 Harry Potter, and he's one of almost 50 Harry Potter minifigures. You're a mess, Harry! That facial expression is absolutely fantastic. This shows Harry on his shopping trip to Diagon Alley in the Chamber of Secrets movie. It's his first time travelling by flu powder, and in a rookie move he shouts out Diagon Alley instead of Diagon Alley. He ends up in Borgen and Burke's in Nocturne Alley, and is eventually rescued by Hagrid. The face is absolutely perfect, with all of the soot and the broken glasses. Thankfully Hermione has a spell for that. Oculus Ripero! Harry's alternate expression brings him back to his normal self. I love the smile, and of course we have the glasses and the lightning-shaped scar. I don't exactly know why, but all of the kids seem to be wearing their normal clothes with just Hogwarts robes over the top. In this case, Harry has the very small legs we see used for the kids from the first two movies. The torso print shows Harry wearing his Gryffindor robes, but of course these would have flowed down over the legs. They don't just stop at the waist. Around the back we have some printing for the hood, and also the red lining. I suspect Ron will have the same torso print. When it comes to recreating the costume from the movie, I can see that LEGO played it safe. We've seen so many Harry Potter minifigures over the years, and the costume on this one isn't really a standout. That face covered in soot absolutely is, it's brilliant! Moving swiftly on, this is the HP 248 Ron Weasley. Ron has about 22 different minifigures, so he is pretty common. This one is not particularly special. The sand blue short format legs are a very standard element. The torso is exactly the same as Harry Potter's, and whilst this is new, it actually appears three times in this set. Referring to the movie, Ron was wearing his robes over a hand-knitted Christmas jumper with a big R on the front. Lego clearly wasn't paying attention. The face and hair are recycled parts, and used in four other Ron Weasley minifigures. I do like the cute smile and freckles on the first facial expression, but the second does an absolutely fantastic job of capturing a terrified Rupert Grint. There's no question that Ron should be included in this set, but I would have liked to have seen perhaps a new facial expression or some different parts. Staying with the Weasley family, we have the HP 249 Ginevra Molly Weasley, aka Ginny. She's pictured wearing the same costume that she was wearing during the book signing in Flourish and Blots. Lego hasn't quite got the colour right here. The dark pink minifigure torso doesn't really match the purple shawl she wore in the movie. The hair is a good choice for the character, but I do miss those braids and the badass attitude. The minifigure legs are the very short black variety and have no printing. The torso, on the other hand, is unique to the minifigure, and shows some kind of shawl which is tied at the front. There's a little bit more printing around the back, which shows creases and some of the red lining. The facial expression, whilst cute, is pretty generic, and likely to be a stock element. I also don't think this looks very much like Ginny Weasley. The alternate expression is also very atypical for Ginny. She's a pretty confident and strong young woman, and you don't generally see her pouting like this. Ginny's first appearance as a minifigure dates back to another set based on the Chamber of Secrets. She's changed a lot since 2002, and also shrunk quite a bit. I'm glad to see that even back in 2002 they captured Ginny's freckles. Overall, we now have about six versions of Ginny Weasley as minifigures, and I've got to confess, this is not one of my favourites. While we're on the subject of disappointing Weasley minifigures, this is the HP 250 Molly Weasley. We actually have two Molly Weasley minifigures from the 2020 set, and they're both goddamn awful. I realise the books describe Molly Weasley as being quite rotund. Although we saw Julie Walters wearing some padding in the movies, she never had a bloated face like this. The figure that came with the Burrow in 2010 outclasses the newer minifigures in every way. The saving grace is that they've not done a bad job of recreating the costume. Molly is wearing several layers, and they seem to have recreated those quite nicely in the printing. She wears a brown shawl over a green crocheted vest, and then we've got some kind of fluffy purple number going on underneath. Printed on the back, we have the hood and lining of what must be a set of robes. Molly also stands on one of these curved skirt pieces, but LEGO hasn't bothered to print it. If this were a collectible minifigure, the printing would go all the way down to the feet. LEGO really has taken some shortcuts with these 2020 sets. The hair, for a want of a better word, looks a little bit frumpy. I think it's just a little bit too short for Molly, and doesn't really complement the face. You already know my thoughts on this facial expression, I really don't like it. This expression shows Molly with a slight smile, and the other expression is frankly just a maniacal grin. Molly never looked like this, even when she was facing off against Bellatrix. Out of the three Molly Weasleys made so far, this has to be the worst. Stepping things up a bit, on the left we have the HP 251 George Weasley, and on the right the HP 252 Fred Weasley. 
George has the green vest and Fred has the orange vest. Again, LEGO hasn't bothered to print the legs, which is a real shame because they really should be pinstriped just like the suit jackets. The torso prints like the twins are virtually identical. The jackets are the same, but they have different coloured shirts, ties and vests. One detail I really do like is the W on the ties. If you watch these very closely in the movie, you'll notice a flashing light. If you look super close at those Ws, you will see a flash over on the right hand side. The printing on the back of the torsos is identical with that pinstripe pattern. Comparing the minifigures to the movie, I think the designers have done a decent job. Both sets of facial prints are lifted directly from the Series 2 collectible minifigures. This is a real shame because I do like to see exclusive expressions with the collectible minifigure series. Fred and George's perfect tailoring also made an appearance in the 2010 Diagonally set. Even though the minifigures were dressed in the Weasley's Wizard Wheezes suits, Weasley's Wizard Wheezes itself was sadly missing from the 2010 set. George's main facial expression has this kind of big but unsure grin. The alternate expression is absolutely fantastic and shows George with his face screwed up having a good laugh. Fred's more confident expression makes him look like a bit of a wide boy. The alternate expression makes Fred look a lot more reassured than his brother George. These are really nice minifigures and deserving of a place within the set. Getting back to the small people, we have a very young looking Hermione Jean Granger. I've got to be honest, this is a bit of a lazy minifigure. The hair is recycled from other minifigures. The torso is the same print used on Harry and Ron. And in the scene in Diagon Alley, Hermione doesn't wear trousers, let alone brown trousers. She actually wears a cute little red and black tartan skirt. When it comes to recreating the costume from the movie, this only gets a passing grade. The facial expression is very cute and that is accentuated by the use of freckles. The other expression shows a slightly more dismayed Hermione. Maybe she just found out there isn't any homework this weekend. Don't get me wrong, Hermione is a very nice minifigure. There just isn't anything to really make her stand out against the other 21 or so Hermione minifigures. The HP254 Draco Malfoy is a little bit more unique. We can't get excited about the stumpy black legs, but the Slytherin robes, at least for the moment, are unique to this minifigure. The Gryffindor robe print is also new for this set, but of course we got three of those. Draco's robes, at least for the time being, are unique. He doesn't wear this exact outfit in the scenes for Diagon Alley. All of the kids just wore their house robes over their normal clothes. The sneering face and accusing eyes are absolutely perfect for Draco. I also really like the alternate expression. I don't know what upset him, but he certainly seems quite angry. Around the back you can see more printing for the hood on the robes, and then of course we have the slicked back blonde hair. It is a great choice for the perpetually mean Slytherin. So that was a nasty piece of work that is Draco Malfoy. And here we have the man who shall no doubt hear of my insolent comments. This is the HP255 Lucius Malfoy. The costume is a very good recreation of what we saw in the movie. The only detail I can see that's different is the brown fur collar on the minifigure, which is black in the movie. Lucius comes with a cane which doubles up as a wand, although clearly we're missing the silver end piece. This time we have full length printing from the torso down onto the legs. It really makes for a much more pleasing minifigure. The torso print is packed with detail, including that fur collar and a fancy clasp for keeping the robes together. Some of those details are really nicely picked out in metallic silver. The continuity of printing from the torso onto the legs is very much appreciated. We even have some printing on the back of the robes for folds and that fur collar. The facial expression is every bit as mean as you would expect to find on Lucius Malfoy. It's a good one and it's a good job because the alternate… well let's just say he doesn't have one. The hair of Lucius Malfoy is perfectly blonde, perfectly long, and the perfect advert for L'Oreal. This is a great minifigure, a great representation of the character, and possibly one of the best in the set. This little guy with a face of pure wonder is the HP256 Harry Potter. This is Harry as he was dressed on his first ever visit to Diagon Alley with Hagrid. The torso print is exclusive and shows Harry wearing some of Dudley's hand-me-down clothes. These are clearly way too big for Harry. He's also wearing some oversized trousers with a big belt, and yes, I did mix up Harry and Hagrid's legs earlier in the video. The costume is a pretty good recreation of what we saw in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on Harry's first visit to Diagon Alley. I do think the minifigure's t-shirt should be grey and not green. On the back of the torso you can see the pattern of the shirt, and this is some really nice printing. Some printing on the arms to match the shirt would have been a bonus. The printing on the face is exactly the same as the other Harry Potter minifigure. On the front we've got the wide-eyed Harry, and then on the back we've got Harry in blackface. Harry, that's not cool and you should know that. 
Overall, this is a really nice minifigure, and I'm very surprised that LEGO didn't call it out on the box art. And finally, for the minifigures, we have the two mannequins we saw in quality Quidditch supplies. These are actually a lot more exciting than you might think. Both mannequins have plain white legs, but it's the torso print we're more interested in. This uniform belongs to the Ravenclaw House Quidditch team. You can see how the robes tie together at the front. And then we have some really nice silver printing around the house crest and also around the collar. The house crest, of course, depicts the Eagle of Ravenclaw. Around the back we find some more printing for the hood, and if you angle it to the light you can see some more metallic printing. The other mannequin is very similar, but this time we have the yellow colours of Hufflepuff. You can just about make out the black and yellow house crest. Around the back we have some more printing, picking out the creases and the hood. So why am I so excited about these two Quidditch mannequins? Well firstly we've never seen these designs before, but they also complete the set. We got the Gryffindor and Slytherin robes back in 2018 in the 75956 Quidditch match set. Now all we need to do is go out and buy a bunch of $400 Diagonale sets, and then we can have our own Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw Quidditch teams. While the quality of some of these minifigures might be a little bit below par, the volume is absolutely fantastic and it's great to get some obscure characters. So not only is the 75978 Diagonale an epic Lego set, it also has a pretty good selection of minifigures. But how does this compare to other LEGO sets with the same name? Let's take a dig through the archives. Released almost 20 years earlier, this is the slightly tragic 4723 Diagonally Shops. The shops in this case are not named, but I think we're looking at Wiseacre's wizarding equipment, and also the Magical Menagerie. These very colourful sets were targeted at girls and used a lot of elements from the LEGO Scala range. This set also gave birth to the first ever Hermione Granger minifigure. Yes, this is the HP001 Hermione Granger. There are actually three sets just like this, and you'll find reviews of two of them on my channel. They use these rather interesting cardboard backdrops. These introduce more wizarding pets into the magical menagerie. Winding the clock forward 10 years, this beautiful, beautiful thing is the 10217 Diagon Alley. This is seriously collectible and is worth about $344 used or $454 mint in box. It also contains a bunch of really collectible minifigures. Although this is a good sized set with 2025 pieces, it's considerably smaller than the new 5500 piece version. The set includes Borgin and Burks, which should technically be in Nocturne Alley, Gringotts Bank, which absolutely has to be included in the next instalment of Diagon Alley, and then we have a scaled down version of Ollivanders, which actually has a much more intricate roof. Finally, we have the micro scale version, which was a free gift with purchase in 2018. This was built out of 374 teeny tiny pieces and is really collectible. Mint in box these fetch $66 and used like this around $43. Sites from Diagon Alley include Gringotts Bank, which isn't included in the new set, a tiny version of Ollivanders with all the gold windows, a green fronted store which represents Flourish and Blots, quality Quidditch supplies which is picked out in red, and a teeny tiny Weasley's Wizard Wheezes. So that was set number 75978, Diagon Alley, from LEGO Harry Potter! I know you've waited forever for this, and if you've made it through all 55 minutes or so of the video, congratulations! It's a magically mammoth set, absolutely jam-packed full of details. I love the appearance of Diagon Alley, and this is going to make an absolutely fantastic display piece. What I didn't enjoy were those stickers, they were a pain in the ass. I'm still upset about the quality control with the Weasley's Wizard Wheezes stickers, but I am pleased to report that LEGO are sending me a new sheet. It was fantastic to get 17 minifigures, but some of these were better than others. I particularly enjoyed Bozo, the Daily Prophet photographer, Florian Fortescue, and I think LEGO did a great job with Lucius Malfoy. With a price tag of $400, this is a serious investment. I'm just a little frustrated that LEGO didn't invest more in their quality control. That said, I've really enjoyed putting together Diagon Alley, and I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I did making it. If you did, a thumbs up is always appreciated, and don't forget to subscribe for more LEGO Harry Potter goodness. Thanks a million for joining me on this journey down Diagon Alley. Stay safe, and I'll see you on the next build video.